gentlemen, welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. In this episode, I have um, a few different replica sound cards that I think you're gonna find really interesting. So uh, let's take a look. The first card I wanna take a look at today is this replica of the AdLib card. Now you might ask, why would anybody want to clone an AdLib card? If you take a look at eBay, you'll see that right now there's only one original AdLib card for sale right now. It's in Canada and it has seven days left on the auction and it's already bid up pretty high. What's worse is this one is even listed as untested, so they won't even guarantee this card works. And if you go back and look at completed listings to get an idea of what these things have actually sold for, well, this top one here for $100 is actually another clone. I don't know if it's the same clone I have here, but the next two in the list are the real things, and this one sold for $360, and the next one sold for $450. So uh, genuine ad-lib cards are very rare these days, and very expensive. And since the card isn't that complicated and all of the parts are still available today, it sort of makes sense why people are cloning it. Now, this clone looks really nice, but there are some differences I'll point out. Uh, first of all, one dead giveaway that this is a clone is that all of the chips are socketed. And I don't think any real AdLib cards had socketed chips. Also, uh, the original AdLib came with a larger style headphone jack, like this, but later models did move to the smaller ones, so uh, this clone, if anything, is just replicating the later models. So I'm gonna be using this computer to test the card in. Now, I borrowed this from DJ. Um, this is just a... Um, kind of AMD K6 clone machine from probably the late 1990s. And the reason I'm borrowing this is because um, the only machines I have in the house which have the ISA style connector in them uh, is uh, my old Tandy 1000 and it runs at 4.77 megahertz. So it's really not fast enough to properly demonstrate, you know, some of the software that I'm gonna wanna show you. So uh, this will work fine. Instead of a hard drive, I've got most everything I need loaded onto this compact flash card. And I'm gonna just pop this into the little IDE adapter thingamajig and uh, this just goes right down into one of the IDE controller slots, like that. And next I'll insert the AdLib replica, and uh, we'll see if it works. I'm going to load up one of my favorite games, Ultima 6. I'll run the setup first, and I'll select uh, Video Mode, uh, VGA. Do I have a Microsoft mouse? Actually, at the moment I don't, so uh, I'll say no. And here we go, uh, sound card setup. I'll select the AdLib synthesizer card. You may notice a note down here at the bottom that says all sound effects are heard through your PC speaker. And this is because the game only plays music with the sound cards no matter which card you select and it still relies on the internal speaker for sound effects. Anyway, uh, let's fire this thing up. Sounds like it's working to me. I'm going to skip ahead to one of my favorite ad-lib tunes. Of course, in the actual gameplay here, uh, you can only hear the music and no sound effects because I'm recording directly from the sound card and all of the sound effects are coming from the PC speaker. Okay, well moving along, I want to show you another fascinating card. Now this is another replica of an even more rare sound card. It's based on the Innovation SSI 2001. Now if you'll notice, the main socket here is empty, but it's labeled that it needs a 6581 chip. Well, that's the SID chip from the Commodore 64. Now, this replica card doesn't actually come with a SID chip. However, you know, any SID chip should work, so I'm just gonna go ahead and borrow the SID chip right out of my Commodore 64. So where did this obscure sound card originally come from? Well, the first mention of this card can be found in the 1987 release of the game Gunship by Microprose. In the README file it says, uh, support has been added for the Microprose soundboard, the entertainer. The presence of this board is detected by the program and enhanced sound is automatically generated. Only two games are known to support this card, and that's Gunship itself, and also Sid Meier's Pirates. Of course, with later copies of these games, support was removed along with any mention of the card, and it's believed that this card was never officially sold. Which is too bad, because in 1987, the only established sound card for PCs had been the Tandy 1000's integrated three-voice sound system, which had come to market in 1984. But up to this point, most regular IBM and compatible machines had to make do with the little one-voice PC speaker. 1987 was kind of the year when all of that changed because that's also the year the AdLib card came to market along with the Game Blaster. And yes, that's right, uh, that was actually a card that came out before the Sound Blaster that everyone's heard of, as well as the Roland MT32. 
However, two years later in the August edition of Compute Magazine, you can see the innovation sound standard mentioned here. It says that the Commodore 64 has always outplayed Big Blue and its pals with its sound synthesis chip. It also says that the board was developed jointly by Innovation Computer and Microprose, which makes sense. And as you can see, the Innovation card would have been very price competitive at $129. However, apparently it was often on sale with coupons directly from Innovation for as little as $69. Again, making this a very attractive deal. The trouble is, in those days, any piece of hardware you wanted to use, such as a video card or a sound card, had to be directly supported by each and every piece of software that you wanted to use. There was no such thing as sound drivers back in the day to give your sound card a universal software interface to other software. So the key to making your hardware a success was to get lots of software developers on board to support your device. Well, innovation apparently failed in this regard, and one possible explanation is because the card was also directly supported by Microprose other software developing companies might have considered supporting this card to be supporting their competition. But uh, another more likely explanation is they were just simply too late to the market. Had this card actually showed up in 1987 in full force with full marketing, it might have stood a chance. Still, there are a handful of games that support it. If you go to Moby Games and you type in Innovation, you can click on the sound card type here, and it will show all compatible games with the sound card. And there are only 13 listed. <laughs> What's worse, I downloaded all of these games and found that only about half of them actually had support, meaning that support was probably removed in later releases, or that the copies that wound up being archived on abandonware sites may have simply had the necessary files removed. However, uh, there are still a few I can show you, uh, but first, I'll need to borrow the SID chip from my Commodore 64. Um, here we go, I'll just pull this out. And I'll stick that right down in there. I also wanted to mention the original card could only support the 6581, but this card can actually support the later 8580 SID chip as well, which runs at a different voltage and sounds somewhat different. And you may notice right there by my thumbnail, uh, there's a little jumper wire. Uh, so to use the later chip, you would need to cut that and uh, replace it with a transistor and some other changes. Okay, uh, let's remove the AdLib replica card and replace it with the SSI replica. Now I'm going to run the setup again for Ultima 6, and this time I'm going to pick option 6 for innovation. I can tell the music is a little different, probably due to only having three voices. Let's skip to the next song. While this sounds a million times better than the PC speaker, I gotta say the ad-lib version still sounds much better. So uh, back to the innovation card for a moment, uh, here's the actual gameplay. Again, music only because the sound effects are coming from the PC speaker. Uh, let's look at another game. This is Bad Blood, which is another origin game and also supports the innovation card. The music is okay, I guess, but it's relatively underwhelming. The game itself also has no sound effects, uh, just music with this card. Now, one thing I wondered about is if the actual C64 version of the game sounded exactly the same, since it is the same sound chip. So I downloaded the C64 version and tried it out. The uh, music is actually totally different, and I'd go so far as to say much better. In an ironic twist, the uh, C64 version has no music at all during gameplay and instead has sound effects, which is totally backwards from the MS-DOS version. Here's another game called Battletech, the Crescent Hawk's Revenge. Interestingly in the setup, you can choose your graphics card, so I'll pick VGA. And for music device, they actually do not list the innovation card at all. but. Uh, for the sound device selection, they do list innovation here. Uh, so let's try it out. Infocom presents the Crescent Hawks Revenge. Yeah, so apparently it only uses the SID chip for digital sound samples, not at all for music. Well, let's try something else. Uh, this is a DOS program designed to play actual C64 SID tunes over an SSI card. <laughs> uh, let's try Commando. Uh, 
Okay, uh, let's try Ultima 5. I know the file name says 6, but it's really 5. And here's Monty on the Run. Okay, uh, well, this all works just fine. Okay, let's pull the card out for a moment, and then uh, let's pull the 6581 chip out. I want to try something else. This is a Swin SID Ultimate. It's a modern replacement for a SID chip. It's actually a microcontroller that emulates the SID. And this is a really amazing little piece of engineering here. It's too bad that nobody can actually produce real SID chips anymore, so uh, this is the closest we can get. Well, uh, let's stick this down in here. <laughs> this isn't what uh, this chip was designed to work in, but it'll still be interesting to see if it works. So let's uh, power on the computer. Interesting, it made a little ding sound on power up. I wonder if it'll do that on the C64 as well. Anyway, uh, here goes Ultima 6 again. Well, other than the volume being a bit lower, I can't actually tell any difference here. Uh, let's try the introduction music. Yep, uh, sounds about the same. Okay, uh, let's try the SID player again. Everything sounded pretty normal except for Monty on the run. There's something wrong with the percussion track. Uh, let me demonstrate this in Audacity. So here's the real SID version. And this is the Swin SID version. And uh, you can hear some of the percussion track is missing. So what we need to do with this guy next is actually try it in the real Commodore 64 and see how it works there. Okay, so here's an interesting piece of trivia for you. Um, as you can see, the computer appears to be working. However, if you'll notice, there's no SID chip. So the C64 will actually boot without it, it just won't have any sound. But also certain other things may not work, such as games that use paddles, uh, programs that use random numbers from the SID chip, or old modems like these which actually use the SID chip to produce the DTMF tones for dialing phone numbers. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and stick the Swin SID Ultimate down in there and uh, see what it does. Interesting, it does make that same chime sound when powering on. Let's try it again. Yep, it does it every time. I guess that's a good reminder that there's a Swin SID inside. Okay, uh, well let's try something with music. Check out the little LEDs on the Swin SID. There are three of them, one for each voice. Well that's pretty cool. Let's try something with some digitized samples. Well, uh, that seems to work just fine. I suppose what we should do next is try Monty on the Run and see if it has the same problem as it did on the SSI card. Well, uh, one noticeable difference is the tempo, uh, most likely because this is an NTSC machine and the version we heard earlier was probably emulating a PAL machine, and uh, the CPU speeds are slightly different on those, resulting in music that runs at different speed. Anyway, it appears to be working perfectly here, so whatever problem it had must have been related to timing or something in that SSI card. Okay, so there's a few other things I wanted to say about the Swin SID Ultimate. Uh, first of all, there's some extra registers that you can send some poke commands to from your Commodore 64 that will change the emulation from 6581 over to the 8580. So if you like the sound of the other SID chip or whatever software you're using sounds better with the other SID chip, uh, then you can change this to have whichever one you like. Uh, it also has some extra waveforms that the original SID chip does not have, which uh, so far I don't think any software has taken advantage of, but in theory it could produce uh, some other sounds. Um, as for the AdLib card though, <laughs> I'm sure some of the eBay sellers out there that are selling original AdLib cards are probably not thrilled about these clones, but I'm actually kind of glad they're out there because the original AdLibs are so rare and uh, these give an opportunity for more people to experience the 
original AdLib hardware. Now, I use the term original a little bit loosely here. I mean, it is all the same original hardware that you would have gotten on an original AdLib card. It just happens to have been manufactured more recently. So uh, I still would think that this is uh, more or less original. And of course, uh, the same thing on the SSI card. I mean, these are darn near impossible to find. So uh, I'm glad somebody is making a clone of those as well. And uh, who knows, maybe some more future software will support that. So I hope you enjoyed seeing these uh, replica sound cards and uh, stick around for the next episode. And thanks for watching. If